so let's see. Uh, Leah, Alex, Jules, Coco. Cool. <laughs> it's so quiet. So we're going to wait a couple more minutes just to, for a couple more people to show up. So feel free to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> you don't need to be quiet. Thank you. Um, actually, um, so we're actually on the website. Okay. Um, okay. Long bars, like it's very finicky. <laughs> no, massive, but it's nice. I think you have to turn the mic on, right? Mendo, it's on like a good strip on this one that time. So, hey, Virginia. Um, and Richmond. Oh, I know if it's way over here, it's too hard. Then we can just make it. So, but thankfully, everything united is great. Um, these men out there, they're all let me grab you. So, like, or I don't have to like yeah. to get there. Yeah, so if it um, the navigation was great at the very end. I know, I'm sorry. So I think it's the two eyes are this one. Sorry. Yeah. The, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah next okay. Time. Um, just so sorry to update you guys on the questions. Sorry just to update you on the questions I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask, uh, what's it actually like to do what you do? So slightly different than I said before, like the the realities of of the job, and then the, what the path was that you took in the life events were so slightly different. Sorry, okay. that's what you put in the email, right? Yeah, so that's what was in the email. Okay, yeah. not what I just said. Right. So okay. I was like, oh. <laughs> okay. so I'm glad I looked it up. <laughs> so um, remember, you're scrolling that way. What is it? Oh, to get over it. Yeah. Can you tell you what is over there? Okay, and then is it? It's already started. You don't have to do that. They're doing it on that end. Okay. You guys are gonna have to share mics. Yes. Okay. Okay. They're on now. Um, you actually have to share it with me too. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I won't be talking that much, so I will start us off. Okay. All right. Okay, well, I think I think we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, and then if others show up, um, then we're good. All right, so I'm going to start. Um, is the mic picking me up? I'm gonna focus over here then. Better? Okay, so I'm gonna start with the land acknowledgement um, and then I'll come in and introduce everybody and we'll go through some questions with them. All right, so. Um, as an organization within MSU Denver, CBA acknowledges the indigenous people and the land of Auraria and the broader Denver area. We honor and acknowledge that we are in the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne and the Arapaho nations. This area was also the site of trade, hunting, gathering, and healing for many other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples as the original stewards of the land and recognize indigenous people still connected to this land on which we gather. We also acknowledge the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants who worked the stolen land for the colonists and who's, who continue to disproportionately face economic oppression, racism, racism, violence, and exploitation. Lastly, we want to recognize the communities and families of Auraria, displaced by the creation of this campus for MSU Denver to have a place that we now call home. 
We share this acknowledgement to encourage all of us here to consider how our work in this space and in our daily lives can address these historic and contemporary atrocities. All right, so welcome to uh, the art and work panel discussion um, about murals. Uh, so this was supposed to take place two months ago and it got snowed in. So thankfully we've been able to um, reschedule it and do it today. Um, so I have four uh, delightful people with me here today, and they're each going to introduce themselves as we show some images on the screen. Um, so I'm going to let them do that. After that, I have just two questions for them. Uh, one is, um, what is it actually like to do the job that they do? And the other is, how did they get there? What were the life experiences, education, um, opportunities that they found to, um, to get them where they are today? And then I think hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. It goes pretty fast. So make sure that you're really actively listening so you have questions to ask at the end. All right, so I'll start with Leo Brenner Clack. All right. Um, hi, I'm Leah Brenner Clack, and I am the founder and the executive director for Streetwise Arts. Um, and Streetwise Arts is a nonprofit based in Boulder, and we focus our programs around mural art and public art. Um, one of our main programs is a mural festival. We've done that for four years. And then we also do a lot of community projects where we partner with other nonprofits, um, other businesses to do mural projects with them. And then we also have an education program where we do um, arts education that is inspired by street art and the culture around street art with K through 12 students all around um, Denver and Boulder areas. Fantastic. All right, next up. Um, and let me, sorry, let me quickly shift gears here and pull up our slideshow. Technology is always. <laughs> Okay, so how do I come over here? <laughs> All right, quick, someone tell a joke. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do I get my arrow back? <laughs> Thank you, Melody. <laughs> oh, there we are. Oh, yeah. is All right, this question yep. here. All right, fantastic. Okay. All right. So, Alex Pangburn. Okay, go ahead. Yes, my name is Alexandria Pangburn. Um, I just went full time art in November, but I've been doing it for about four years in conjunction with another full time job. Um, and then I'm also one of the founders and executive director of Babe Walls, which is an all women and non binary mural festival that we've been doing. Um, we're going on our fourth year this year. So, Yay. Yes, thank you. Sir. <laughs> and I hope you'll talk about both of those things. I will. Great. Also, next up, Jules Mendoza. Hello, uh, my name is Julio Mendoza. I go by Jules. I'm a muralist from Denver, Colorado. I was born in El Paso, Texas, and I lived in Mexico and Tia Juarez. And I'm a, I've been a full time artist for two years, barely, and, but I've been doing murals for four years. All right, well, for second, second, second. <laughs> Sorry. Do you forget me? I know, I like all the going too fast. All right, thank you. All right, Coco Bear. Hey, I'm Coco Bear. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm a muralist and also do filmmaking and some other things uh, based here in Denver. Um, I've done a lot of street art over the years and been doing murals now since um, I guess almost almost 10 years uh, coming up and I've been doing street art around town um, much longer than that and uh, uh, is there more to that? oh yeah I'm also uh, one of the uh, <laughs> leadership group that puts on babe walls uh, mural festival and other things that we do throughout the year and um, uh, I guess that's about it Awesome. Great. Thank you. All right. So I think what we'll do, and I'd love for you to all talk 
sort of together, right? So each of you can kind of answer the question and then we can discuss, right? And you can sort of chime in as we go. Um, but yeah, the next question is, you know, what is what is it really like doing your job? It's not all glamour, is it? No, <laughs> it'd be super frustrating, but also can be really fun. And um, it's like a carnival. It's like you walk in and there are all these different booths and depending on the time of day or like year time of year, everything is totally different. Um, so I know like as muralists, like time of year is very important in what we do and so yeah we're trying to like balance the whole like studio side with also the mural side which can be challenging sometimes and when you say studio side what do you mean um like so not only do i do murals but also studio work so i'm doing paintings uh, my main medium is acrylic on wood panel um so trying to do that and really utilize my time in the winter when i'm not having as many murals so that shows throughout the year I have pieces that I can put in them. Um, I have two solo shows this year, so I'm constantly trying to produce work. So, yeah. Cool. And what about the business part of it? Where does that all fail? Yeah, I think that's really the, yeah. the hardest part, you know, and when you go to art school, you don't, there's really not a lot of emphasis on that you're all of a sudden going to be in this art business. And um, I think that is the most difficult, challenging part is you just want to make art and it's like that part you know how to do and there's an element of enjoying it and also an element of work to it it's like it's, it's you want it to be enjoyable all the time but sometimes with that's work but the part of getting new jobs and just communicating with galleries and organizations and uh, curators is uh, is a whole other skill set it tends to be a lot of us who are drawn to being artists like we're fine being by ourselves and working by ourselves but this like outward communication thing is a little bit more of a challenge at least for me it definitely is and just all the email and all these other things and just you know you have to be if you're doing something as a business you have to be professional and that means answering things in a timely way and being able to have the information that people need and then when you're doing scheduling things i think is one of the more difficult things that we all do especially when you're dealing with murals that are out in the world it's like you know, if it's snowing you're not going to put up your piece and uh, or do your work and so you always have to be aware of like the environment and coordinating to have access and then a lot of times on larger murals we need specialty tools um, lifts are the most commonly yeah. rented thing that uh you know so that's a whole other thing where you have to have the lift there and it has to be the right kind and you have to have insurance and you need to know how to run the thing you know so there's all this stuff that there was definitely no class about in art school in any way and uh um and when you're starting out and for a long time all you've really got is you you know i think that's the hardest thing about uh, being an artist is you don't have this organization that you're part of that kind of takes care of parts of what you're doing. It's like you're your accountant, you're your PR person, you have all these different roles. And uh, I think that's the part that I would classify as being really hard um, is being like that responsible business part. Because if I wanted to be do like if that was my nature to be doing that maybe i would have been doing something completely different you know it's like the two skill sets aren't necessarily like come as a single unit and i think everything is part of it but just like i said it's always like a learning experience with everything that you do and i was just talking to a friend uh he was he's a illustrator but he graduated with a business degree so he says that the business part comes really easy for him so he's really glad that he he has a degree in business and, and now he's doing art so i know he's i think that's a great combination I'm not saying that you should take business to do art but i think it's really helpful to learn those tools and because they really come in handy when when it comes to doing contracts and just doing all your 
you know, accounting stuff and all stuff, the things that you don't think about when you think about doing murals and paintings and all that stuff. So. Yeah, for sure. No, we're not going to say all the bad things about it. We'll tell you good things too. <laughs> um, I know like for me, this, this is my first part where I'm actually applying to things and I've been getting rejection letters over and over and like you can only take so much as a human being to be like rejected. <laughs> so I've really had to lean hard on my network group and my community um, and just the people that I've met over the whole years that I've been alive to really bring together projects. So thankfully that's like kind of getting me through the spring and like into summer for projects, which has been really nice. But yeah, so you gotta have some thick skin for sure. Yeah. I mean, every year is gonna be different. I think the same for me. I mean, there's been years that everything that you apply or whatever you you get accepted, but then there's times where you get a lot of did not like nose and a lot of doors closed for you and then but it's I think you have to I know it's part of it and I just have to keep applying to stuff you know like don't just apply to like five mural it's just apply to everything that you feel like connects with what you do you know and eventually something's gonna say yes but someone's gonna say yes but it's like this, every year is different. Every year, it's sometimes you have to focus a lot of um, in murals, outdoor murals. Sometimes it's indoors. Sometimes it's shows, galleries, or sometimes it's a lot of studio time. But everything's part of it. So I think it's that's the fun of it. That it's not always the same, you know. Every every month, every year is different, and this is what makes it fun and what kind of like what keeps me going every time. The, Every time, like a door closes, you know, I just, I just feel like if something doesn't happen, it's just, it's not meant to happen at that time, and it's, I better utilize my time for using to do something different, you know, something it'll come up. Yeah, it's really a good skill to try and develop to not take stuff personally, because most things aren't personal, you know, even if it feels that way, and when it's your art, which is something of your making, it's obviously a personal thing, but their decision isn't necessarily judging you as a person. You know, it's like they just don't like something about it or um, and that's a really hard. It's easy to say, but it's really hard to do, you know, and. Because uh, um, it really is. A lot of fun. Like there's a lot of fun in what we do and like there's kind of all these parts, but then when you're actually doing the mural, even when it's like there's things that are crazy going on, weather and stuff, it's like that part's fun, you know, but it's like all the other stuff is the work part. And so they just go together, you know, and uh, in order to have fun, you have to to work. I think for me, what, what I say is the most important thing. Like if you want to do this as a, as a profession, as a career, so to make a living out of it, I think it's really important to make sure you have a balance between work and the business side and your your personal life, you know? So just because you're a full-time artist or whatever, you can't forget about your own life, you know, about your hobbies and all that stuff, you know, because if you just kind of bury yourself with a lot of work of Murals, I don't know, it's eventually it's going to be overwhelming and it's going to, I don't know, you're going to start feeling different than how you first started, which it was, you started doing it because you, this is what you love. So when you start not having that balance, you know, and just forgetting about everything else and just doing, like getting busy doing art, uh, I don't know, it can, it can get to that point, but yeah, it's easier to just work all the time and like, I think that's a really good point is to find you mentioned like hobbies, like something that's like totally in a different headspace, you know, and when your studio is in your house, it's really easy to like <laughs> really work hey. all the damn time, yeah. you know, and uh, to actually put breaks because that's what actually feeds your art is going and having other experiences mm -hmm. and interacting with people. Well, you don't want to turn your passion into your job, right? Because then it's just work. Right, you want to keep that passion uh, going. 
for sure. You know, it's tricky. It's tricky when you start looking at them as jobs mm-hmm. because there's like something kind of implied in that that you mm-hmm. are pleasing the client. And it's really easy, especially when you're starting out, to really want to please the client. You're like, you're always kind of like, oh, they gave me this job. I don't want to, look. you know, it's like, and the hardest thing to develop is to be able to say no to things that aren't true to what you want to do. And um, I've been doing this project with the help cards and stuff and I've had multiple people to be like, oh, you know, can you put like our business name on them and things like that. And you're like, you have to have these lines where you say no. And sometimes it means saying no to money, which is hard when you need to say yes to rent that month, you know, and uh, it's <laughs> like, um, but you have to, it's really easy to like kill your joy in it. Um, like I worked as a professional photographer for a long time and photography has always been part of my art practice and it literally like killed that part of my art for a while. You know, it's like I, it resurrected back up, but it's like, if you're always worried about pleasing clients and it's just, it's a, it's really slippery slope. That's not, it's not really being an artist at that point. You're just doing, you know, illustration for hire, which is fine, but it's not the same thing. Right. I wonder if those of you who have run mural festivals can talk a little bit about the other side of the rejection, right? I mean, cause you yeah, guys it's so have- so hard rejecting people. Yeah. So hard. Like I, yeah. until I did it the first uh-huh. time, it was just like, <laughs> it's, like yeah. it's so hard being on the other side of it. Because you, you have so much stuff to look through and then you're trying to see the whole. So like you, if you have people who have similar styles, it's like you want variety, you know, and, uh, and it's really hard. And it's even harder when there's people in the mix who you know. Yeah. You know, and, um, For sure. and know that you're judging it. <laughs> yeah. Like I think like running mural festivals too, like it's really important to have specifics on what your mission and your goal is because that really helps you know pull down who you're going to accept and then it's easier for you to tell them like i'm really sorry but this is why like but you should try this other festival which i think you'd be a great fit for yeah for sure i think that's really important um because otherwise there's just so many amazing artists that apply you know um i think if you go into a project and think about what is it that you want to do besides create murals and have you know this beautiful art like what are the, what are your goals and what um you know how do you want to support artists and how do you want to impact the community that you're in and so having those outline it gives you a nice framework to reference and say okay this checks this box this checks this box and it's a whole package and um but yeah it's super hard i mean people love mural opportunities and it's such a fun experience but yeah it's so it's super competitive usually yeah. Also, just the fundraising aspect is really difficult. Yeah, I'd say that's probably the most difficult. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very hard. Because I it's think, really expensive to, yeah. especially with Bay Walls, we pay everybody. Yeah. We pay everybody the same amount. And uh, I've been part of festivals where there were people making huge amounts and you were making nothing. You know, it's like, so when you're trying to also run a festival in an ethical way, the way we do with Bay Walls or Streetwise, it's like you got to raise more money too, you know, and uh, and it is really hard. And the one piece of advice I would give people when you're submitting your stuff is like, look at your submission and try and like remove yourself from it and be like, does this really express like what I'm doing? And it's like, if I'm applying to a mural festival, it's like, there needs to be a picture of a mural in there. And like, we specifically try and team up people who've never done a mural before with someone who has that sort of the Bay Walls mentoring model. But it's like, you can still paint a wall. Like, even if you haven't had a mural commission, you can be like, mom and dad, can I paint your garage door? You know, it's like something that shows that, oh, I want to paint a wall. I mean, don't you agree? That's like when there's no, kind of connection to that in there. Um, but something that really shows who you are, like take the time to have photos, because that's what it's, the words, the photos are really what it's about. You know, it's like saying, it's like, that's what we're really gonna look at. And Yeah, and you don't have to have a wall, like you can get 
plywood boards yeah. and put them in your backyard and like show some initiative them over and over know. and over. Um, just practice, you know, it's practice getting bigger and that's, that's your example, you know, and then that's really kind of all you need people to see that you have the drive or that you can scale your work and, um, you know, that, that goes a long way. So there's creative ways to do it, even if you don't have an actual wall opportunity to paint. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I think organizing a mural festival is a ton of work. It's super fun, but it is like a year round thing. It's, mm -hmm. it ends and then it begins right. like you start right away. Year, it's like, yeah. Like take yeah. a week off, you're like, okay. Maybe. Yeah, there's like grants that you have to kind of apply for months and months in advance. And then you're planning the festival and still don't know if you have that money. And then you're like reaching out to sponsors and making a sponsor deck. And, you know, it's just constant things to do. Like there's just so much to do. It's like, and you're doing it kind of at the same time. You're like planning the festival and trying to raise money. So that's kind of stressful, like at least for us. It's like, yeah, I don't know if we're going to get the money, but we're just going to like cross our fingers and hope that we do and like make adjustments where, where we need to. But I think asking people for money with sponsorships was a big learning curve for me because I don't like asking people for money and right. talking, yeah, just like pitching yourself and like why this project is important and why you should support it. It takes practice. And so it's definitely going to be hard to do that at first, but the more you do it and the more you get comfortable talking about your project and why it's important, like just if you're passionate about it, you can talk about it. I mean, I hate public speaking and I hate talking to strangers. So but it's so much easier if you believe in like what you're doing and the artists that you're working with like that excitement comes through and people want to support you so it is super intimidating but i think just put yourself out there like do the things that are scary and hard for yourself because then it it makes you grow and it makes you learn and then you just get better at it and you figure it out i didn't know how to do any of this stuff before i started doing it so <laughs> it was like i'm just going to try to figure this out because i want to make it happen so it's kind of the way that it works <laughs> yeah and also now you don't have to do it by yourself yeah. like yeah. you do have a whole team behind you like i have a whole team behind us and um yeah there's you no you don't have to do it by yourself yeah. and that makes you it really stressful if you try definitely need a team to do well and i think that's one of those dangerous myths in the arts at all is that there's some like sort of lone genius that makes it all happen and it's never true right, right? yeah no and that's even so great an artist it's like once you made the paint, the canvas, and yeah. lit the room, all these other things, it's like other people, you've got a team. Well, and that's what's so great too, is like when you're building this team, you're like building a whole community. So, you know, lean on that community as an artist too, to be able to help you find opportunities, or if you have questions about what you're doing, to be able to reach out to those people. Like Streetwise and Baywalls are all about building community and like making sure that we all have resources and like people to go to for questions. So. Denver has a really great art community here and um, should definitely be utilized. Ooh, well, I think we'll move on to the next question then. If you would sort of talk about your actual path, like the things that you actually did that led you to where you are. And maybe, do you want to start, Coco? Sure. Um, I grew up in a family uh, of artists, so I always saw that that could be a job, um, which I think is an advantage. But at the same time, it was also incredibly intimidating to sort of be like, oh, I'm an artist too, when you have people who were like making their living in the arts. Um, I originally started out just taking photos and Polaroids um, with my like, parents' cameras and just was obsessed with image making. Um, and then in college, discovered like uh, mechanical duplication and start doing printmaking and making murals with Xerox machines and things like that. And um, kind of got sucked into working as a professional photographer for um, many years, um, which was fun. But again, it's like you have this like tank of art, like you got 10 gallons of art making in you. And it's like, if you're using 10 gallons for your work, it's like, you don't have anything left for anything personal. Um, so I kind of got burnt out on, on doing that. And at that time, just kind of reconnected with doing street art, which I had been doing in college. And that led me to connect to our street art and graffiti um, culture here in Denver, which is really an amazing group of people. And this is a, a great town to do street art in. There's, almost, there's fewer spots now as things get more developed. And, uh, but and then migrated to doing murals, basically got my first mural project when, before I really even knew 
something out to do what I was doing, you know, which is a lot of times how that happens. It's like you get those opportunities just open up and pretty much um, I've been doing it ever ever since then. And uh, uh, I really love being part of Babe Walls uh, the last few years and just kind of work on a different part of it all. And the, the mentoring part has been really cool. To, uh, we've literally like raised up this group of uh, mural artists who've never done murals before. And we have a bunch of them who like work regularly now, you know, or like we know that they did their first mural at Babe Walls. So that was really amazing. We did uh, our first Babe Walls out of town this year. Uh, the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, which was a really amazing experience and just kind of seeing our baby grow. But mm -hmm. <laughs> was also really crazy, like doing an event and like not just in another city, but like in the middle of nowhere, you know, it's like a, a thousand mile. I was 800 miles from here, you know, in like a, a middle of North Dakota. And um, so that's been really great. And, I want to see where we go with that as we continue to grow it. And Can you talk a little bit? Because you mostly wheat paste, right? Yeah, I, I do mostly uh, wheat pasting, which is basically, if you don't know, um, it's taking a print that you made and putting it up on a wall using either. Most of my installations that you see in the streets are done with a uh, biodegradable glue. I just want my pieces to kind of uh -huh. rot and fade away. Um, and then during the pandemic, I did this project, uh, Spread Hope, with the Hope Hearts, um, and then the Rainbow Hope and Love Hearts. Um, so yes, I have stickers for you guys. Um, and uh, that was a really amazing experience to uh, to kind of get to do something during COVID. Like, we were all sort of locked down. And I usually go, and even though I do a fair amount of commissions now, I like to just go and put up stuff on Sundays usually is kind of my day. And uh, the um, pandemic started up and we we're all in lockdown. I was like, well, I can still go pasting. It's like, I'm not interacting with anybody, you know? And, uh, and the pieces I was putting out felt really inappropriate at the moment in time. They're really mysterious. And I was like, we don't need mystery right now. And so that's where the whole part kind of came out of that and switched my whole paradigm of how I put things up. I'd always, looked for spots and, you know, I don't do anything really illegal. It's almost kind of vandalism light. Um, but literally just ask people on my Insta, it's like, if you have a high visibility spot for one of these prints, let me know and I'll come put one up. And, uh, and I'm still getting uh, requests to this day, printed up thousands of them and put them up all over Denver, Colorado. Leah was one of the first people who got me spots for them up in Boulder. Uh, then it's spread out around the country. I just did one in Miami, uh, okay. along with the Bay Walls crew uh, back in December during our Basel. And, and kind of, we've talked a little bit about funding, but how do you fund that? You know, that was another thing that kind of flipped my paradigm. Like for one, the whole asking, it's like, oh, I just had to ask for spots and then people would give them to me. But I did it right off the bat as a pay it forward Thing. And so if you had a spot that fit the criteria, I came and I put one up and people who were businesses and stuff, like some of them gave donations. And so I just had a, a print fund and I do a bunch of free ones and I do one and someone would give me a couple grand. You know, I just, it, it ended up always funding itself, which was like the first time where I hadn't had like some sort of financial model kind of uh, with public art projects. And uh, so it was really interesting to see how something could be completely different and still function. It's kind of, it's slowed down now. Like I, I need to be more in that fundraising mode uh, and that's not my forte either. And, uh, um, but uh, it's pretty much always paid for itself. And, and there were times like in the first year, it started in like April of 2020 is when I first put the first ones up where the first like six months, I mean, there were weeks where I printed like two thousand dollars worth of color printing, and I mean, some serious like expenditure. <laughs> it was very counterintuitive to be like, let's spend money we don't have on this stuff, and, uh, but it always like filled in, which was really it's really interesting, a cool experience, and cool. and it I run into people on a somewhat regular basis who 
they have this completely their own personal experience with those pieces that has nothing to do with me other than the fact that I put them up. And, uh, and it's like a really special thing. Like I don't, I don't take it lightly. Like I don't know that I could recreate any of that magic like ever again, but so, you know, when you have people coming up to you and telling you that, wow, an image that you made, like help them feel better, that's, that's like amazing. Like that is an amazing thing, you know? And so I'm really thankful I was able to do something that was positive and also kept me sane because it allowed me to like be art making and, and it ended up being kind of a good time for, for artists as far as having a lot of places to do art, you know, and, uh, which is kind of interesting. Flip on the whole thing. Jules, what was your path? Well, for me, I think it's uh, it's different. <laughs> I guess my family wasn't a. Uh, I don't know. I think my dad used to like to draw, but uh, and my brother used to do like graffiti back in Mexico. I, and I think that's kind of like my inspiration where it begins. Where, where I got like the inspiration for art itself and just kind of like the the need to be expressing myself and putting it out there on the walls. But I think it's like my career as a as an artist, I started four years ago. Um, when I went to college, I wanted to start, I wanted to do art and graphic design, but uh, I ended up with a criminal justice degree because I think it was a lot of the her pressure of, I mean, people saying, telling me that art is not a degree where I, that we're gonna, I was going to make a living out of it or get a job. And I think that also puts a lot of pressure as a, like, a, how do you say it? When you're trying to make your parents proud, if you're a first generation student, so I feel like that's a lot of pressure on just getting a, picking a career that's going to make you money, you know? So I took business and uh, I'm bad with numbers. So I took criminal justice and that was fun. So I finished with a degree of criminal justice and I did work my degree for three years and I had like an, an office job. I was kind of like a, probation officer, like a supervision and a supervision program. And that job really made me realize what I was missing in me. And uh, after working on that job for two and a half years, I just, I mean, I decided to save up some money and left the job, I quit. And I just got like uh, small jobs, you know, I just, I was working on construction. I was doing um, uh, restaurants and Comcast, Lyft, just any other little jobs into, I started working on a restaurant and that was on, on the weekends. And that gave me the chance to, or from Monday to Thursday, I was working on any, like in my mind, I was like, if I want to do this art thing, I gotta, I know I gotta, do what I didn't do in school, you know? So I was just on YouTube doing, like watching a lot of YouTube videos, painting like on my sketchbook and just practicing, you know? Just doing a lot of uh, uh, things, watching a lot of videos on YouTube on learning on, on murals that I admire. Mm -hmm. So I just like seeing their journey and just getting inspired, you know? And I was utilizing this, time to to just grow artistically and and gain everything that I didn't do during college, which was what I wanted to do is art. And uh, during the pandemic, that's actually when I was, I mean, by that time I was already doing murals. But after the pandemic hit, I was laid off of my work in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. right. And that kind of pushed me to do art more like constantly. And I, don't know, I just started getting busier and busier. And well, but that's what pushed me to do full time 
like uh, as an artist. But I would say like my first mural was wasn't that that easy to get. It was a uh, I didn't know how to ask someone for a wall or for permission to paint a wall or mural. But it was a uh, one of those things that I wouldn't feel like I wouldn't I didn't have anyone to ask because I, I didn't know like the like a uh, artist community here. The network. So, yeah, so I think that's very important too. And now I like I've known a lot of uh, people that do murals, a lot of the like Leah that runs the, the mural festival. And it just but before I, I didn't know anyone, so I was just trying to figure out how to do my first mural and it was just asking businesses and until someone said yes. And that was like my first mural that I had for in for my profile, you know. And I did a lot of networking in my in my neighborhood on Westwood. Mm -hmm. It's not far from there, but that's where I grew up when I came to Denver. And I did a lot of networking there with because uh, it's a it's a small art district, but right. it's yeah. the art district so. Mm -hmm. I was just asking a lot of people there and they're the ones that gave me the first opportunity to do uh, a gallery to be part of it and then to do my first commission. So my first commission was uh, like electrical box and that was just like a dream come true. Like it was like something that I never thought I was gonna do. And just to see my art on the street, you know, and getting paid. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's the best. Seeing your stuff yeah. is awesome. And also, <laughs> seeing getting stuff and yeah. 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 it's like, that means I was like, well, like, so then after that, I just, I don't know, I started to, I guess, just build my, my portfolio with more art. And so I feel like the networking with the right people, it's, it helps you a lot. Because if you don't have like a, like a, community of artists or someone to ask, just you have to do a lot of networking and that's what helped me gain a lot of commissions. And and from there, I just, I don't know, like I said, after that, the pandemic hit and I was pushed to do art like full time and I just been busy ever since. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I think I, I feel like I gained that confidence. I feel more confident about being a full-time artist and knowing if if I'm not constantly working, you know, I just it's also something that you have to know, like how to manage your your money, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes it's like it's not like you do a mural every week or every month, you know. There's it's it's different than just having a regular job. So I don't know. For me, it's that's kind of how like my journey of growing as an artist and I recently got my studio and that's like a big something big for me so and it's there on my in the neighborhood where I grew up in Westwood so right. cool. it means a lot for me yeah yeah that's a great district that some people don't know about in town yeah it's yeah very different than it's very unique than you know each one has like Santa Fe district has this un unique look and then Rhino and Westwood, it's uh, I think it reflects a lot of the community there, which is very diverse and predominantly Hispanic. So it's that's what like the murals kind of represent a lot, like the community mm -hmm. there. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Alex. What's your story? Um, yeah, so I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, and kind of the same thing as Jules. People always told me that doing art was never something you can make money from. Um, but my mom was very artistic, and so myself and my three younger brothers were always doing crafts, and she would always take us out to like plain air paint. And so art was like always something that I did a lot and I enjoyed too. So I took a lot of art classes in high school. Um, and then, you know, at that point, it just wasn't an option as a career. So I decided to go down the pet the path of pre-vet because I wanted to be a veterinarian. So I did that and then very quickly realized that I did not do that. <laughs> not good at math at all, so I did not do well. Um, and it's just a very competitive 
thing and I just didn't have the grades for it. So um, finished my degree out. So I have a degree in animal science with a minor in equine management. So then my new path was that I wanted to be like a manager of a horse farm. And so I went and managed an equine rescue in um, Northern Ohio for a year and a half. And that was really interesting. Um, I wouldn't change it for the world. I had a lot of fun and um, it was like exactly what I wanted to do in that moment in my life. But I still was like always doing art and finding ways to do art. Like I did the logo for the rescue that I was working for. Um, and then I moved to Columbus, Ohio. And that's kind of where my art started to pick up a little bit more. Um, I was working for a vet clinic at the time and decided that, you know, doing these pet portraits of clients' animals would probably be a good second income because you don't make any money being a vet tech at all. So I needed a supplemental income. Um, so I started doing that and then it just got to the point where it just took off. And um, so I had to close my books because I was closed out or I was booked out for an entire year. Um, I got really burnt out doing that, but I ended up doing my very first gallery show and I did my pieces on cardboard. So I was like really into this, this um, like sustainable portion of art where I felt art was very unobtainable and expensive and I wanted it to be something that everybody that could afford. So I started doing my pieces on cardboard um, and did that for a few years and then decided to start doing it on wood. And so I was building my own panels at the time um, and I wanted to expand outside of dogs and cats. And so I did um, birds of prey and deer, just a lot of the local wildlife that was there in the state. Um, and that really wasn't until I moved out here into Denver, um, I started working with the Rhino Art District and I was running the Rhino Maid store, which was a, um, a retail gallery that they had in the source and did that. And I met a lot of local artists that way. And um, that's kind of how Babe Walls came to fruition. I had a lot of conversations with a lot of female and non-binary artists. And there was this overreaching frustration that there really wasn't space for them in these mural festivals, that they were getting denied. Um, and then on top of that, if they were getting accepted, they weren't getting paid. So it was something that, you know, they just felt like they weren't being um, respected in the space and so the whole thought was that we would just do this one mural festival and we would just kind of like as a we show them kind of thing <laughs> and then so we did it and we ended up raising fifty thousand dollars in the middle of a pandemic which like right was really right really, when the pandemic started it was yeah amazing. and it just like took off and we got people from all over the world that were reaching out to us which you know in our first year that was really intense and we just realized that this was something that we really needed to keep going. Um, so on top of all that, I was still doing my own art and I did my first, my first large scale um, mural during a festival in 2018. And from there, it just kind of snowballed. So I was kind of like working for the art district and then also trying to run Babe Walls and then also doing my own art. Um, but which is what was really great is I just built this whole net network that I was able to use for um, just like community and any questions I had, I could reach out to people and be like, hey, have you done this before? Like, I don't know, and Instagram like makes people very reachable nowadays, which is really great. So that's definitely a resource that if you're an artist and you have questions and there's an artist out there that you look up to, just like reach out to them on Instagram. Um, most of the time they write back, but if they don't, don't worry about it. Move on to the next one. Yeah, someone else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, so worked for Rhino up until last November, and I kind of got this point where um, I felt like I was being pushed and pulled in all these different directions, and that I was starting to get burnout, and that I really just needed to take a moment and decide which path I wanted to go on and where my pro priorities stood. And I just really wanted to like fully put myself into my art and see where that could go. Um, so then last November I went full-time artist. And so I've been doing that, but I've been into the whole, the cafe, which is um, an online opportunity. If you guys don't know about it, I would check it out. Um, but just applying, getting rejected, <laughs> trying not to be sad. <laughs> but then there's like all these other opportunities that have come up outside of that. So just like Jill said, like a door closes, but then others open. So 
really just relying on your network and your community of people that you have made and that you know and stuff just won't stop coming around so but yeah i work mostly with aerosol um, for large scale and then for my studio work i do acrylic paint on wood panels so it's just been a really interesting journey and i don't know anything by any means like i'm learning every day so it's also just one of those professions that you have to be fully open to change and it's something that i'm learning to do so yeah always something new cool and what was your path i had kind of a strange path to to where we are today but um i grew up in california and high school in colorado springs and um, single parent um, spent a lot of time with my grand grandmother and my grandparents and she was very creative and so we were always making things and doing creative things but like through school um i think you know art was always in the culture of like my community of people that i hung out with like skateboarders and going to see shows and you know posters and things like that but i never really thought about it as like a career path um i was always kind of in this mindset of like i gotta make money i gotta get a job what am i gonna do and that was like really difficult for me to figure out um, as a young person and didn't really figure anything out. Um, went to college at CU and switched majors a whole bunch, like trying to figure out what I was going to do, what kind of job I was going to get, what I liked. Um, couldn't figure it out. Ended up, <laughs> ended up studying anthropology, which I really liked because I loved learning about people and culture and um, it was just endless and it was just so beautiful and I was just really inspired by that. So. Obviously, that's not very good career path. It doesn't really go anywhere unless you want to be a professor and get your doctorate and all of these things, um, which I didn't. So after college, I sort of was not sure what I was going to do. Um, I loved snowboarding at the time, so I moved to Washington State um, so I could snowboard out on Mount Baker and kind of just got whatever job I could and which ended up being like in property management and real estate. So I kind of had that path for the first um, years out of college. Um, which wasn't my passion, but I was able to make some money and pay the bills and then do the things that I liked and um, and then switched gears again and ended up working for a snowboarding company um, and customer service for a little while and office management work and um, that was fun. But I think all that time too, I was still like involved in the arts community. We go to art openings, collected art and posters and just was that was like a hobby, right? That was like what I was into. And then through that network of community, um, eventually, like 10 years later, um, I was like getting more and more into it. And um, I was like, I think maybe this is where I want to go. Like, this is what I want to do for my work. And sort of just started doing projects with creative and artist friends of mine. Um, and then doors opened uh, in that field. Uh, my friend opened an art gallery in Rhino, which was super tiny at the time. It was like 2010. He was like, I want to show my art. Like he got laid off from his job. He's like, I'm going to open a gallery. I want to show my art and other people's art and come and manage this gallery and help me run it. I was like, hell yeah, I'll do that for free. You know, I had my regular job and I did that with him and basically didn't know what I was doing at all. Just tried to figure it out. I knew I loved artists and knew a bunch of artists. So I just started curating um, art shows in that space. And then the office job that I had at the time that was my real job, decided they were gonna open a creative space in Boulder. Um, and they were like, do you wanna help? I was like, yes. And so that sort of transitioned into that and ran this um, space called Made Life, which is a creative hub. Um, it was a retail gallery, all local artists um, and shop and then they had a creative learning space where they did workshops and like a black box theater and um, all kinds of different creative paths so i did that for about five years and i really loved working with all the artists and the community aspect um, but definitely got burnt out on the retail part of it like selling artwork is super hard especially in boulder like boulder people want to buy landscape artwork um, and that's kind of it or nothing at all. Like there just wasn't like a really supportive community of people that were buying artwork, especially the kind of artwork we were showing, which was sort of more edgy, contemporary. Um, and it was so much work for the artist and I just got kind of bummed out. And at the same time was seeing murals and mural festivals start popping up. And it's like, this seems like a really awesome pathway. And we also were doing murals that made life too. And in connection with the shows, we had a wall and the, the murals in Boulder were like not 
in existence. There was like a couple of them. Um, so that was like really weird to me. Why, why don't we have public art here? It wasn't like Denver at all, where it was just kind of organic and street art happened. Boulder didn't really have that. So I was like, this sucks. We need to change this. Um, so I just saw an opportunity, like a, a hole to fill in Boulder and the creative culture of Boulder. Um, and I thought I could do it. I was like, I think I can find walls and opportunities for artists. I love supporting artists and working with them. So I wanted to keep that going and get artists paid. And like, you know, once you get a mural out, people see your work and they're like, oh, who is that? And then they follow them and they get another opportunity. And so I just saw it as a really sustainable thing for artists and like a really fun thing for me to help make happen. And so, um, yeah, I just sort of started out trying to find individual walls and put projects together one by one, um, try to ask the city for some money and I found a wall and then I pick up, find an artist. And at that time too, I was super um, interested in supporting um, female identifying artists because in the culture at that time, it was very male dominated, um, wanted to give more opportunities. So yeah, I just um, kind of just put it out there and had built a network through that creative work of people that maybe would be interested in buying or commissioning murals. Um, and it just sort of just built, but it was just one project at a time for a long time for the first few years. And then, I mean, in the beginning, I totally wanted to do a mural festival. It was like, that's what I want to do, but it wasn't going to happen that easy. So I sort of just built up to it. And um, as people in Boulder started seeing more murals, more people were open to it because a lot, nobody wanted to let me paint their wall. They were like, what? You want to do graffiti on our wall? No, you don't get it. But finally, people started getting it and seeing the work. And now it's like so much easier to find people that want to do murals. So it took a while. And then we did the first mural festival in 2019. It was 10 walls and a gallery exhibition at the library. And yeah, it just kind of started getting bigger and bigger and more people were excited about it in Boulder and wanted to support. And now we have the mural festival, but also still do our community programs, one-off murals and education programs. And yeah, and I, I didn't really know how to do any of it. I really just <laughs> wanted to do it and tried to figure out how to do it by reaching out to people like Jasper from Pow Wow Walls. I just like shoot him an email like, hey, can you tell me like how to, how to start this? And he was super friendly and got back to me and, you know, surprising um, people want to help you figure things out. So um, you can do it. If you're passionate and you want to do it, you can do it. Okay, well, that's a <laughs> great way to sort of end this portion. Yeah, I think we have a couple. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. How much do people pay for a mural? There's no one answer. <laughs> yeah. it depends on the client. <laughs> the client, the complexity of the wall, you know, and uh, how long it needs to be up there. And well, there's a lot of factors. And then also sort of there's all these factors that are purely like, okay, it costs this much to rent that. We're going to use as many supplies. And there's this X factor, which is how famous you are, not famous, or, you know, it's like that kind of when you're starting out, um, you tend to do stuff without even realizing it, not making any money, you know, because you're really doing stuff for cost. But uh, it kind of, you have to keep on, it's like kind of what the market will bear. And do you typically like make a proposal with a budget attached and ask for that? Or do you, I know sometimes when you're applying for public work, there's a budget that they have mm -hmm. so you can sort of yeah. build towards. I usually price out the square footage. It's mm -hmm. kind of the only um, kind of simple metric and it's kind of that way you can encompass a lot of other costs into one cost, which is easier to to comprehend instead of trying to, and that should encompass like what all your materials and all those other costs are into that one cost. Mm -hmm. It's just clear. And then that's also something you can add or discount depending on, you know, and obviously if it's for a huge corporation, it's like they're used to paying a lot more for things mm -hmm. than small business. And you kind of have to, it's up to you to decide. And it's actually really the hardest part of yeah. That's why I asked. There's nothing worse than like <laughs> dropping a price on someone and they're like, oh, is that all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ray, I just got a question. Say that there are no flat rates for murals. 
Uh, There's definitely a huge range and it also depends on where you are at in your career. Like if you don't have that much experience, like there is uh, like a lower dollar per square foot that you should be charging. Whereas if you have like all these years behind you, you know, you obviously are charging for a higher rate, but average what I'm seeing is like anywhere between $20 a square foot to $50 a square foot plus. Yeah. So it's a giant range. Doing, you know, like screwing themselves doing once for $5 a square foot and stuff. Yeah. There. And, and sometimes you do, a lot of times when you're doing festivals and stuff, yeah. you'll make quite a bit less than you would off of your regular rate, but it's, it's worth it because you you want to be part of that, that festival, but also it's like, if I hadn't been in Crush Walls when I was originally in Crush Walls, like I got so many jobs off of that to be able to be like, oh, here's a piece that I did, you know, and it shows them that not only have other people gone, oh, okay, you can do this, but that you can also complete mm. a project, which is kind of important. Well, there is that status thing. I mean, you talked about the X factor too. So maybe for someone, the fact that you were in Crush Walls makes you more attractive because you're with that crowd, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. And and you have to milk that stuff, even if it's your like, you know, like before I mentioned, I dropped Art Basil <laughs> into our, our thing there. It's like when you do like stuff that you have to be promoting yourself, even if it's not your nature to be self-promotional, it's like pretty much no one else is going to do it. So you need to do it, you know, and even if it goes against your very being to like be that it's like you need to like help people understand why they're paying what they're paying and the value and what they're getting. Okay, you guys said you guys had a youth program? Yeah, both Streetwise and Babe Walls. So like we usually do it's called the Future Babes Wall but it's a youth wall that we do. And then uh, Grow Love, who's also one in our leadership crew, she runs a lot of youth programming. So we're working on a grant right now so that we can hopefully have an entire year of youth pro programming put out. But and is there like a certain age come to be or? Nope, we take little babies. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> well, she like oh, okay. Eight, cool. She was in a couple of years. Very cool. interested. How we go about it? Yeah, for sure. So we like we list everything on our website or our on our Instagram. We'll like push it out, and if Girl Love's offering anything, we'll push it out as well. I know you guys probably have a yeah. We work simply with schools sometimes, doing um, like a series of workshops uh, after school, but we also do like a mural workshop that's just open to anybody that wants to mm -hmm. do it. Um, and again, we'll put that on our website of opportunities and. Um, basically, it's just a learning experience of yeah. how to create a mural with another small group of of youth and. Um, yeah. Or, you know, you can just apply to the main event. It's like if you have yeah. the experience and have work out there, it doesn't matter what age you are. Like we had a 14 yeah. year old and they all standing rock, mm -hmm. you know, working with their mom, but they did an amazing piece. You know, it's like that's, it's mm -hmm. more just like when you say, oh, well, she's done a few walls. Like what you're saying before, it's like there's a picture of something on a wall that someone's done that. When I see that in that application process, I'm like, wow, here's somebody who's like, they're not just saying, oh, I wish I had a wall to paint on, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, I found a way to do this. That, like, yeah. that goes a long way. But also, like, kind of what I was saying earlier, if there are artists out there that you yeah. like and you love their work and you think it matches with the path that you want to do, just reach out to them yeah. and see if they have any opportunities for, like, assistance. Because I know when I'm on bigger jobs, I'll pull in assistance to come in. It's never the same person. Um, just it helps to like just put yourself out there, and then you're on their mind. So, yeah, and apply to our next festival. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Streetwise so we're, tries to give an opportunity to a young artist who maybe hasn't had an, a mural yet. Um, so there's we're always open to supporting young people. Yeah, no wait, you guys to yeah. uh, start doing what you want to do. Yeah, right. Totally. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Oh, good. Yeah, David. Uh, when it comes to like, the project that you intrigued by and excited by, do they have conditions that don't really come to you? Like, will they pay or just like in this deadline? Have you ever had to negotiate? And if so, like, what skills will lend you up to paying my contracts? Like, will you achieve like, for yourself? It's like the whole way. Do not undermine your values and all those things. 
it's really hard to do. <laughs> it's like, especially when you have these other constraints, like you need to pay your bills and things like that. And uh, it's really hard to say no to stuff. Um, but uh, it's something that you have to just keep working on your self confidence and and know that it's like when your instincts are telling you like this isn't a good fit for me or somebody's like has too tight of a deadline you know you're not going to be able to, it's like you have to be able to be like this isn't going to work this way and you know maybe you can work with them to to make it so that it's actually feasible but most people who are <clears throat> contracting to get a mural done like they don't know anything about murals you know and but they also know like kind of how much money they want to spend. And that's really the hardest part. I think of all for the buildings is getting walls. And then you have property owners who it's part of their business, you know, is this wall. And so if you're going to put something that they think is offensive or, you know, they, they want to try and control what goes on that wall. Um, and that's one of the trickiest parts, I think, of the like, kind of organizing. but. You just have to kind of stand up for yourself and yeah that's where like knowing your square foot like sticking to that and then yeah. having a little bit of a wiggle room range and then being like okay i'm not going to go below this for anything um but also just like reaching out to other artists too and just being like hey like what's the lowest you would go and yeah people will tell you doing all that yeah your tools are all around you yeah and i think from the uh, like an organizer perspective there's usually flexibility totally. and like just ask because you know, they'll probably put this proposal together, like this is how much you want to spend, this is our timeline, but there's usually always flexibility in there. And if you're nice and like you want to do it, but these things are important for you and you just ask like, hey, I, I really want to do this project, but this timeline doesn't work for me. Can we push it back? Or, you know, this really isn't quite an, as much as I need to make this project work for me financially. And can you bump it up to this? Like if you're just genuine and respectful and how you ask and, and you want to do the project, a lot of times they'll say yes, like, yeah, we can make that work or maybe we can't do that, but we can do this. And, you know, I think it's just, you know, having that confidence to speak up and ask for what you need. Yeah, because most of the time they don't know what yeah what it is. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm curating a project right now for a building in Sunnyside and their budget started at 20 and now it's at 50. So again, they just didn't know. And so when an artist came in and was like, well, I charge this, they were like, oh, we had no idea. So. Yeah, just ask. There's an education element to it too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I remember for me, like, I had a breakthrough on how much I charge when I was really like fretting about a job. And I was like, well, I wonder how much like a commercial contractor would charge to paint this wall white. Mm -hmm. And it, it was like just like a little less than I was like stressing out about charging, you know? And I was like, I'm actually quoted them more. And they said, yes, you know, it's like you can almost go down. And obviously, if you're so high up there and uh, it's like when you're in a restaurant, and you look at a painting on a wall, and it's like seven thousand dollars. And you're like, yeah, no, it's probably good. You know, it's like you have to be realistic. And that's based on your experience. You know, ultimately, it's like, but um, you can always go down from whatever your set rate is. And then you're doing somebody a favor. Working, it's like that's a position of power. But the worst thing is taking a job that then like. I, I'm sure we've had a lot of the experience where we've done things where, you know, you end up doing a ton of work and breaking even, and that sucks. And it's just not even worth it. You could have just stayed home, you know? Cool. All right. Well, um, I know you all are, have rides coming, so I'm going to let you go. If you have more questions, though, stick around. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stickers, stickers, sweet. Awesome. Yeah, that's it. I need to have, have, have some that was going to bring them. Oh, that was fell on top of you. That's the best opportunity. Oh, more stickers. Like, get stickers. Yeah, right.